James Melville joins me now. James, thanks uh, for coming uh, back on the show. But before we turn to the WHO, have you got your monkeypox suit yet? Oh, God, yeah. I mean, anything for a fancy dress. I mean, basically, we're, we're going through Project Fear again. I mean, it's like a Mobius loop of Project Fear. We go through the same cycles of another threat, um, more fear, more man media manipulation, and then more, ultimately, more control. It's the same cycle again, but I'm willing to bet on this one there's less people buying this particular cycle of fear. Yeah, but a cycle of fear seems to be what they are determined to get up. I have seen multiple references to the monkeypox in just the last 48 hours. And it turns out, just like actually the coronavirus, that they war-gamed an outbreak of monkeypox just last year. Is that right? Yeah, there is all of that. I mean, I'm trying to separate out the stuff that's actually you know, between fact and fiction. But I think what's happening with all this, and I say this right at the start, right at the start of the pandemic, I bought into the first lockdown. I thought it was government ineptitude and panic and we go along with it and see what happens. But pretty much by May 2020, I, I, I wasn't buying this because of the collateral damages that were stacking up. And then we got to vaccine passport and discrimination on medical choice. And then we go to the point that you touched on, the WHO, we don't know the details of what's coming down the tracks on this treaty, but it's stripping away two key things. It's stripping away basic individual choice and freedoms. And secondly, it's using fear to coerce people to go down that cycle, stripping away freedoms. Now we should, you know, I say this as a, you know, a Remainer campaigner, whereby I have a problem now where the model of globalization has massively changed to where it was after the post-war settlement in 1945, where it was set to put ties that bind, to keep us secure, to increase trade routes, to collaborate, good, for good reasons. But it's become bastardized. It's now become completely out of sync to a point whereby it's stripping away control. And the worst thing about it is most of the public are completely unaware of what is happening in this cycle. And if we're not careful, we end up, say, with the next pandemic, whether it's monkeypox or something else, and we end up getting told what to do in terms of public health response by unelected technocrats based in Geneva, rather than the individual sovereign rights of states to decide what the response of a pandemic should be. Well, that's right. It's a double whammy. Uh, it doesn't just strip personal sovereignty from the individual it strips national sovereignty from the nation state. If you're in the WHO, if you sign up to this WHO treaty, your freedom to decide what to do about a future pandemic is uh, null and void. It will be a globalized response, won't it? Yeah, I mean, I think that's okay. If you look at in one dimension about collaboration of information and research and you know, communication and data, that's okay. That's just sharing information. For me, as an internationalist, that's a good thing. We should be learning from our neighbors and collaborating. But that's very, very different to taking away laws and public health laws. One size does not fit all in a pandemic. If you look at, for instance, different responses, the diametrically opposite responses between Sweden and, say, Australia, you cannot have that broad brush approach coming down the tracks from the WHO. Now, I caveat that and the fact that we don't know what the meat and bones are of the treaty yet. It might just be about collaboration, but it's very ambiguous, some of the things they're saying. And interestingly enough, George, going back to the, basically the spring of 2021, the WHO started peddling this idea of a globalised treaty. And they did, it was a circular that was sent across the world's media. There's 25 co-signatures to that memo that was put out to our media. One of them was Boris Johnson, which I think, I think is somewhat ironic considering he was a self-styled freedom fighter to claw back sovereignty from unelected pesky bureaucrats in Brussels. Yeah, take back control only to hand it, only to hand it back again somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing with Johnson. I mean, 
there's no consistency there. What he said about Brexit, again, I said say this is Romania, what he said about Brexit, about taking back control, at the moment he's giving off the impression that he's giving away control, not just potentially to the WHO, but that also applied to SAGE as well. What we need, if a major issues of crisis or emergency or a virus, is we have to have the collaboration between the parliamentary democratic levers within our parliament and also consultation with the public. We vote for these bits of legislation, we vote governments to implement them. They might go in different directions from their manifesto, but it's still a democratic process, and they should be. But to get to a point where we risk giving up freedoms, public health laws, in whatever scale to the WHO is, I think, completely unacceptable. And I think they've got two aspects here that we need to try and inform people of. Firstly, this potentially is coming down the track, so even over the next few days. And secondly, we need to have a conversation about where are we going in terms of our own democratic rights? For me, the, 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 the pillar of society has to be about freedom. You should have the opportunity to protest, to strike, for freedom of movement. But certainly in terms of legislation, we cannot put ourselves at risk of basically the WHO, unelected technocrats, clawing away powers and democracy from 194 countries. That is completely unacceptable. But I do caveat the fact that we do not know what the details of the treaty are. But it is our obligation to try and make people aware that this is a risk because most of our media simply aren't covering it. No, they're not. That's why I wanted to speak to you on here about it. Uh, I mean, what's the, the best case scenario is, as you say, uh, it's only about collaboration and information sharing and so on. What's the worst case? Well, the worst case scenario is enforced lockdowns, vaccine passports, vaccine mandates. I mean, we've skirted with these issues, obviously, in the UK, not just from lockdown, which we went through, but also in terms of vaccine passports. UK government was perilously close to implementing that. And I think, I suspect, the only reason they didn't is because they were busted by their own party gates. You know, the only hospitality that was open during lockdown seemed to be down Downing Street. But we got perilously close to that. And so we're at a situation whereby if the treaty is about just collaboration, then fine. But if it starts being ambiguous and being open-ended to suggest that they will enforce lockdowns, despite the fact a future pandemic would have, to, in terms of different case levels and different mortality levels in different countries and different healthcare systems in different countries. And I used the example of Sweden versus Australia to show the compare and contrast. Or if we slip even further towards vaccine passports or vaccine mandates, that's not just about stripping away democracy that's stripping away basic civil liberties and it's you know it's a moral obligation george not just for our politicians to be to make sure that the who cannot claw back those powers but also our media and one or two of the media are talking about this the information is out there but the public at large are completely unaware of this and we we, we might end up sleepwalking into something that when the next pandemic comes around whereby it's an enforcement from a third party that isn't elected that takes away our civil liberties and our ability to have basic functioning form of freedoms because we've lost the democratic sovereignty to make those decisions within our own sovereign states. Now, I've become convinced that this uh, Tedros, the, uh, the head of the WHO, is a rum uh, character. Uh, how do we get rid of him? Uh, how long is he there scheduled to be there for? How can he be removed? Yeah, but this comes back to what I was saying before, George, about how there's been a sort of mission creep in terms of the power and control from these technocratic organizations, of which I used to be a fan, because it was set up in good faith after 1945, the majority of them. But now it is going too far in terms of, it's not just about pulling levers, but when they start having control over our, effectively our public health policy. That's a massive issue. How do we get rid of them? Well, the starting point is we need to reshape our own domestic politics. We're at a situation now whereby if I look at the government, which I think is pretty much the worst government ever, combined with an opposition that's completely ineffective, you'd normally have within a cycle the same government of 12 years that the opposition have learned a few things by then and they're 
normally by that stage a government waiting. But we have the worst government and the worst opposition, the worst political party structure, probably in living memory in this country, at exactly the worst time. And I think we need something new. I think the public have switched off from party politics. But the dangerous thing is, by switching off and showing apathy, it exerts, it bizarrely, paradoxically, gives more control for these political organisations. But they're not fit for purpose. They're not connecting with people. Right. Look at the cost of living crisis. No one's providing solutions. Now, if we have a double whammy of technocrats taking away our freedoms in, a, in an advent of an emergency under the auspice of staying safe or it's for your own good, and actually the phrase is for your own good is the mantra of every authoritarian museum in history, combined with ineffectual party politics, what's left for the public? Where do the public feel that they're getting help and support? And so we've now got a situation whereby people are desperately looking for, to their political leaders to solve this huge set of crises that are coming down the tracks. But there's no one there. And that's a major problem. Uh, James, just uh, briefly, tell us where people can find you next. I mentioned your, uh, your new podcast that's coming out. That looks tasty. <laughs> it's annoyed all the right people. So it's, it's, uh, we've, We've put it together over the last few weeks. We've done quite a few of the podcasts with a lot of good guests. There's more coming down the tracks. Now, Isabel's a perfect example of what I believe, and I'm a big believer in bipartisanship. That's why we've started speaking again, George. <laughs> but it's because Isabel and I had different opinions on Brexit. We squabbled a lot over it, but we came together over the, the response on COVID, and we had a huge issue with some of the collateral damages around that. And I think it's a healthy thing that someone who... Politics makes strange bedfellows sometimes. And, you can, and I'm a great believer that you can learn from some of the different opinions and also collaborate and work with them. So Isabel, Isabel and I are good friends. We set up this podcast. It's all about scrutinizing authoritarianism and a sort of call to arms to, to claw back our freedoms. The first set of podcasts are largely about finance and digital currency and digital ID and then we'll have wider aspects in, in, in future runs but I think it's important sometimes for people to get their heads out of their echo chambers and start working with people who've got different opinions because if you only work with people who've got the same opinions you're not going to achieve much you know people have to learn I mean if you take the example of me and you George we, we were on the same side against we were anti-austerity and we had a different opinion about Corbyn's approach over Brexit but here we meet again in terms of the response on COVID, and that's a good thing. As Mrs. Thatcher said, it's a funny old world, James. Good <laughs> luck with Isabel Oakshot in your new double act, and thanks for joining us.